How does an educated feminist lesbian activist become a devout Christian and a pastor's wife? Answer, philoxenia. Philoxenia. Let's talk about that. You want to? <laughs> it was 1999 when a 37-year-old Rosaria Butterfield, recently tenured at Syracuse University to teach English, um, described herself as a staunch secular feminist. And she was then in a long-term lesbian relationship. As a professor, the closest she'd ever gotten to any Christians was a few students in her class who refused to read some of her assignments because they found them, uh, you know, contrary to their faith. Her view of Christians was they were anti-intellectual, prejudiced, narrow-minded, and much too exclusive. About this time, she was doing research for a book on the American religious right. Uh, she was familiarizing herself with the whole movement of the right, and she published a critique in the local paper there in Syracuse uh, about the Promise Keeper movement. You remember those probably, and um, about their gender politics, and she received a whole bunch of hate mail, a whole bunch of fan mail from that article. Among the uh, mail that she got was a letter from a local pastor named Ken Smith. She said, and I quote, it was a kind and inquiring letter. Here are her words. She said, it, the letter, encouraged me to explore the kinds of questions I admire. How did you arrive at your interpretations? How do you know you're right? Do you believe in God? He didn't argue with my article. He asked me to explore and defend the presuppositions that undergirded it. I didn't really know how to respond to Ken's letter, but I find myself reading it and rereading it. I didn't know which box to file it in, so it sat on my desk, and it haunted me. So Ken's letter sat on her desk for over a week. She called it the kindest letter of opposition I had ever received. So after a week, she called him. That short conversation on the phone led to a dinner invitation uh, by Pastor Ken and his wife, Floyd. Um, they wanted Rosaria to come to their house for a meal to explore some of these questions. Here's what she writes next. Ken and Floyd did something at the meal that has a long Christian history, but has been functionally lost in too many Christian homes. Ken and Floyd invited the stranger in. Not to scapegoat me, but to listen and to learn and to dialogue. Ken and Floyd have a vulnerable and transparent faith. We didn't debate worldview. We talked about personal truth. Was it what made us tick? Ken and Floyd didn't identify with me. They listened and identified with Christ. They were willing to walk the long journey to me in Christian compassion. Still reading her words, by the way. After dinner, Ken gave me a big hug. Floyd gave me a hug and a, a big kiss on the cheek. We said, we'll catch up ne next week. This was fun. Can't wait to do it again. They did not share the gospel with me. And they did not invite me to church. And that was so wonderful. Because what it showed to me was they didn't see me as a project. Because of these glaring omissions to the Christian script, as I had come to know it, the um, sharing of the gospel and the invitation to church, when the evening was ended and Pastor Ken said he wanted to stay in touch, I knew that it would be safe to accept his hand. Rosaria says, I did not set foot in the church for another two years, but every week I was in their home. And every week it was clear that pretty much anything was fair game in the conversation. We could ask anything. Ken and Floyd were, were fine, and that process of dialogue and table fellowship was compelling. It was deeply compelling. The Bible has another word for it. I know what's on the tip of your tongue. Philoxenia. Philoxenia. 
Uh, I, when I first heard this word, I thought, that's got to be some kind of a flower, right? I mean, philoxenia, it's got to be, you know, what have you been fertilizing with your philoxenia? Or amazing. <laughs> that kind of sounds right. Or maybe, you know, it could be a, an emotional illness or mental illness with a proper therapy. Your doctor's confident that he can help you with your philoxenia. Or it kind of sounds like a city in ancient Greece. In fact, it kind of sounds like every city in ancient, I'll put it on there, like every city in ancient Greece. Our cruise ship will, will then set sail for the Mediterranean coast and we'll make our way to Philoxenia. Yeah. Or, or maybe it's a new medication to fight the symptoms of some disease. Ask your doctor if Philoxenia is right for you, you know? Philoxenia is one of the great words of the Bible. And the sad truth is most of us haven't the foggiest what it is. Trying to think, you know, that prefix, prefix and what comes after. What's this word mean, you know? But it's one of the great words of the Bible, both the Old Testament and New Testament. Major thing. It's not a flower, not an illness, not a city or a medication. It's a compound word made from two Greek words, philos and xenos. You're familiar with these. I know you are. A uh, philos from where we get the word uh, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. Xenos, the word for stranger. You've heard the word xenophobia, fear of strangers. Philoxenia then means love for the stranger. Love of the stranger. It's taking the affection and kindness and warmth and generosity that ordinarily you would reserve for family and friends. And you extend that to the stranger. In English translation, the word philoxenia is very often rendered hospitality. Hospitality. That's a poor, poor word to use for modern English, hospitality, because the way we think of hospitality, it isn't anything at all like this. But hospitality is the act of making strangers feel loved, as, uh, as if they belong, welcome, like family. Hospitality is a thread that is woven throughout the entire Bible. Uh, Rosaria Butterfield, again, who's written, by the way, a whole lot on the subject of hospitality, says this. Hospitality is not fellowship. There's nothing wrong with fellowship. It's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with fellowship. We love having our friends over, you know, think the way we do, and, and, and we're safe together. We can just catch up right where we left off, but that's not actually Hospitality. Hospitality has the stranger specifically in mind because we were once strangers to the Lord. That's a powerful word. Philoxenia. Hospitality. When Paul was instructing uh, the churches um, in a letter to Timothy about who should be an elder in the church and how that should work, a leader in the church, listing all the characteristics that should be present in a leader's life. Uh, now, these, these are the, the ones that model the faith and lead the faith for, for the church, people who was, serve as examples to the rest of us. When Paul was listing the things that we should look for in leaders, he listed the word hospitable. Hospitable. I mean, that's short list. And every word on there is so important. Here's what he says. He says, he, the, the leader, you know, uh, must be beyond reproach. He must not have more than one wife. He must be temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, a good teacher. You know, over the years, I have heard just about every reason why somebody should or should not be an elder in the church. I, I remember one time there was a big discussion about so-and-so smokes. I never did find a verse of that. Man, I wanted one. You know, or you know, somebody saw somebody coming out of the liquor store. You know, shouldn't be an elder. You know, somebody wasn't a, wasn't a very good teacher as they measured uh, good teaching and shouldn't be an elder. And you know, just about everything. But you know what? I have never heard once, I mean, not one syllable in a discussion about whether somebody should or should not be an elder in this. Not one time have I ever heard anybody say the word hospitable. Not one time. It's in the list. 
It's not hiding. You know, it's there. Um, and actually, in the Greek, it's written in yellow, as you can see right there. <laughs> uh, it jumps off the page, right? But Paul says this is what we must have in our leaders. Listen, love of the stranger. You might raise your hand if you've ever heard anybody say so and so should or shouldn't be an elder because they do or do not love strangers. Doesn't come up. That's the problem. That's the problem. And it's not just that philoxenia is for the leaders only. Um, it's this is the way God wants all of his people to live. After the Exodus from Egypt, God calls his people to be holy. Big part of the book of Leviticus, be different, pure, holy, as God is different, pure, holy. In Leviticus 19.33, God instructs his people thusly. When a stranger, they're thinking of a, a sojourner, maybe a resident alien, somebody that's not from here, but is now here, lives here. When a stranger lives uh, with you in your land, you shall not do, you shall not do him wrong. You know, um, if you don't know the language, you don't know the customs, you, you don't have a lot of friends or power or wealth or a support system, you're absolutely vulnerable. And God says, don't you dare take advantage of that one. Don't take advantage of that person. Do not do him wrong. You might say, well, that's not setting the bar very high. You know, don't do him wrong. I mean, I suppose I could avoid doing harm to a stranger if I absolutely had to. But God says, hang on. He's not through speaking here. He's not finished with the thought. So verse 34, God does raise that bar that it appears noticeably low in 33. Verse 34, the stranger living with you must be treated as one of your native born and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Stranger. You shall love him. Love him like you do yourself. Hospitality, the love of the stranger, is the very nature of God. God says uh, to you to extend hospitality because I am the Lord your God. This is not just some little peripheral doctrine out there, you know. You know it's way out on the edge. And once I quit going into the liquor store and smoking the occasional cigarette, then I can work on my philoxenia, right? No. I mean, this is a central doctrine. It's at the heart of the faith and something we desperately need to recover in the church. I mean, it's not something we work on later when we got all this other stuff worked out. Um, it reminds me of, a, of a, a pastor who was preaching and, and he was encouraging his people to be friendlier with guests. And he said, he says, you know, when somebody walks in the room, you know, this reminds me of a sermon last week. You know, when somebody comes in the room, they're by themselves. You know, go find them. You know, be, be gracious and welcome everybody. We're, gonna, we're just going to be so friendly uh, beginning next week, have your eyes open and your hearts ready. And, and it was just really moving. And, and one guy was just particularly, you know, touched by it. As soon as the last amen was said, he turned to a couple of ladies sitting behind him and said, hey, my name's Robert. So good to see you. And one of them said, that friendliness stuff starts next week. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's a command of God. And it is the Example of Jesus. If he, if he was an example of anything, it was hospitality. And the duty of hospitality comes from the very center of who God is. You see it in the beginning, the creation of the world. I mean, what if, what is creation? If it's not the love of the stranger. I mean, maybe you never thought of it this way, but God placed us here in this beautiful place uh, which we took to reckon right away, but he places us in this beautiful place as an act of hospitality. God rescues the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. 
as an act of hospitality. Gives them a place to live as an act of hospitality. He said to the people of the Old Testament, I'm the Lord your God who, who made a home for you and brought you here by my might. Therefore you shall love the stranger as yourself. What does it mean? Man? What does it mean to love the stranger? i tell you what it means or what it doesn't mean. It does not mean and cannot mean elevate your safety above everything else. Because some of you are thinking about that already. If you're looking to preserve you, then you've run this whole thing into a ditch right off the bat. If you've got a list of reasons, you know, why you can't love the stranger, then, you know, you're, you're going to miss this. And it's just, it, this is right at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You kind of intuitively know this is true if you're familiar with the life of Jesus at all. What's it mean to love the, you know, the first, the first uh, Philoxenia story, if you will, that comes to mind for me, you probably got different ones. There are certainly a ton of them in the Bible. For me, it's the Good Samaritan. Remember that? A man's beaten, left half dead, side of the road, and a priest and a Levite come by, you know, one after the other. Uh, uh, religious guys, holy guys, pure guys, uh, they walked by the beaten man and looked the other way. Two religious men who were too religious to love the stranger. But then the hero comes along, the Samaritan. Samaritans were a despised group. You remember this, right? Unfaithful, unclean. But it was this Samaritan who saw the beaten man tended to his wounds, paid for his care. Not a relative of the Samaritan. He wasn't a friend of the Samaritan. It wasn't a guy he knew from work. He was a stranger. Philoxenia, hospitality. It's driving a van on Sunday mornings to pick up these beautiful children and a few adults. Uh, strangers to you. you. You didn't know them. Oh, yeah, you get to know them. They become friends. But when you first went, absolutely total strangers. You had no idea who they were and a little bit apprehensive. You didn't know their names. You didn't know their stories. Strangers. All you knew about them is what you have in common with everybody. We're lost without Jesus. It's like our, like our food pantry. Really, it's like our food pantry. It's serving food to folks for whom a box of food uh, during the month can be a huge help. Or serving you know, 1,500 hot dogs or whatever it is that kids uh, on, uh, at the trunk or treat, a, a significant portion of whom that would have likely been their best meal of the day. It's philoxenia. It's, it's, you know, a sort of prodigal love. I love my church <laughs> because you love the stranger. You uh, practice hospitality, not perfectly. We have room to grow. And trust me, I'm a preacher, so I can't wait to get the part where I point that out. <laughs> what you do, you love, the, you love the stranger. It's welcoming new faces on Sundays. Um, you know, last week I told you that Wendy and I have sort of informally adopted the mantra, a guest sitting alone constitutes an emergency. Uh, that's something that ought to stick to the whole church. So on Sundays we do. We look around for a person who's alone in the room and by himself or herself, and we tend to make a beeline for that one. Uh, the one we don't know. Philoxenia. Hospitality. Love of the stranger. You know, it might be impossible to overstate how important this is for the church and for the life of a believer. I just read recently about the Kelly family. You may have read this story. Um, it's in one of the books I have. Um, but the Kelly family, they never went to church, ever. God was not a part of their lives. Uh, and uh, one Sunday morning, for whatever reason, the parents decided they would go to church. Later, one of them described it as the strangest day of my life. So on Sunday, when the kids were still asleep, the parents came in, uh, shook the bed, woke everybody up, find some nice clothes to wear, let's go to church. Go to church, I've heard of that. The kids just immediately knew 
This is going to be so weird. I struggle to find the right clothes, wondering what to do, what it would be like. You know, more than a little anxiety filled the car. Later on, one of them said, our family was as lost as an Easter egg. <laughs> and yet we somehow knew we needed to try and look Christian if we're going to attend the church. What we looked was dorky and we all knew it. There was nothing quite as bad as, as trying to seem like you were something that you weren't, not to mention being clueless about how to dress in a certain way it was awful. We thought you had to look a certain way to try this Christianity thing out. The only thing worse um, than the clothes was the way we felt when we walked up to the church. We felt like every eye was on us, and they probably were. Now, I could tell my parents were uncomfortable. My siblings were uncomfortable. I, all I know is it was painful. We sat through worship. Uh, no one speaking to us. We had no idea what they were singing or why. Uh, I don't remember what the preacher said. It might have been a great preacher. might not have been. I know my family was not engaged. It all seemed so sanctimonious, like a social club, totally irrelevant for a lost family with a boy about to go wild and a set of parents about to go through a divorce. The service ended. We walked to the car, and no one, I repeat, no one spoke to the Kelly family. We drove home and never mentioned the day again and never once considered darkening the doors of any church ever again. A guest sitting alone constitutes an emergency. That's a philoxenia mindset. That's hospitality, love of the stranger. A lot of ways to practice Philoxenia, uh, a lot of ways, but I'm tell you, there's none that I know of that are that, that's quite like opening your own home. Opening your own home to strangers, strangers. Remember, we're we're not back to fellowship, having all the friends over. We're back to strangers and opening your home. Um, opening your home opens a pathway to God. I've seen it so many times, uh, and I know they're sitting right over here, and they're probably going to snatch me ball-headed, um, but wouldn't take a very big snatch. Ken and Polly um, have for years opened their doors and their wallets, serving countless international students, strangers, students they did not know but who worked to meet, uh, who were essentially alone. They've been chauffeur to students who had nobody to take them to the airport for a red eye and nobody to pick them up in the wee hours, no place to stay over the holidays, no family to do Christmas with. To perfect strangers, they said, come into our home and eat with us and visit. Hospitality, love of a stranger. When Juliet Liu Wait, as she is now after she married. Juliet Liu was a small child. She and her family escaped from Saigon, um, South Vietnam, April 30, 1975. Um, the family had just finished dinner when a loud explosion just rocked their house, shook the house, uh, blew out windows at the back. It was the fall of Saigon, end of the Vietnam War. Juliet's mother had worked for 20 years as an interpreter for the American government. And they had promised her, when we leave, you'll go with us. When we leave, we won't forget you. She hadn't heard from them for days. Uh, she didn't know that they had already left. Uh, finally, when the house shook and the bombs went off so close by, her grandmother decided, we have to go. We have to go now. Take essentials only. Outside, bombs are exploding. Guns are being fired. They made their way literally from ditch to ditch, often crawling toward the airport. It took them all night long to get there. When they got there, her grandmother showed her paper to the guards. The guard said, I'm sorry, ma'am. Your, your name's not on the list. The grandmother begged, please, please. I worked for the Americans. They'll kill us if you leave us here. Her grandmother grabbed the gold jewelry, the few coins that she had, whatever items of value she had taken from the house and gave them to the guard and said, please, take all of this. Let us in. The guard took every bit of it. 
and let them through the gate. They couldn't all get on the same chopper. And they debated, should we wait? And the, the husband said, no. Whoever can get on the first one, go. Whoever's next is next. He waited to be next. As uh, Juliet and her grandmother and a couple of others flew off on the first chopper, they looked back and to their horror saw a missile hit the chopper behind them, blowing it to pieces. It too, took two weeks for them to figure out that it was a different chopper, <laughs> not the one their family members were in, but still in shock, not knowing what would happen. Meanwhile, <laughs> far away in a small church in a place called Lafayette, Indiana, uh, some Christians were convinced that God's heart was for these people that nobody wanted. Together they committed to sponsoring a refugee family, raised money, found housing, gathered clothing, uh, stockpiled the pantry, furniture, all from this strange family of strangers from a stranger land still. Juliet writes this, my mother's family knew nothing about Jesus or the church when they lived in Vietnam. They encouraged a generosity, or rather they were encouraged by a generosity like nothing they'd ever seen before. She says it wasn't just the money and the things they provided. We saw in these people a kindness we had never seen or experienced before. Philoxenia, hospitality, love of the stranger. The Apostle Paul says the good news of Jesus Christ is that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the only reason that you're in here today and the only reason I'm in here today is because the gospel is a story of hospitality. God looked and saw his broken creation, strangers to him. And he chose to do something about it. He didn't wait for us to come to him. Rather, Jesus came to us, entered our world in order to be with us, in order to be for us offering grace, offering forgiveness, philoxenia, hospitality, love of the stranger. Father, we thank you so much that you love us, that you've called us to be the sort of people who will look for ways to love those that we do not know. Father, so move our hearts that we will move our bodies to act on your behalf, to serve, to give, open our doors to invite in those who are strangers. We offer this in Jesus' name. Amen.